things that history hasn't yet started. The prehistory of human society is the current era we are living in now, because we haven't developed the true socialist society. We haven't got to God, so history hasn't even started yet. It's total nonsense. History is the study of the records of the past. It has nothing to do with the formation of some mystical society. Just imagine how demented a mind you You're muted. So what you were saying earlier, you were saying class societies and bourgeois society inherently results in philosophical irrationalism, right? That was one of the things that you just mentioned there. Um, so it's not that humans are getting closer to, or, or like he's saying that there's some real God that Marxists believe in, you know, and trying to get closer to God. When the idea is you just remove this irrationalism, you, when you remove this contradiction from the core of society, am I right? Right. And he's talking about, he's using his understanding of the concept of history which is quite literally just like telling events of the past and using that to judge the standard of what Marx is saying when he means history and prehistory, which is completely different. The term history for Marx as for Hegel uh, has a different concept that it is rooted in than for these people who are using the term but have a different concept um, or have a different notion behind it. The notion of history for Marx, the reason why all history that we've had behind us is prehistory. And when we have socialism, we actually have the beginning of history is because this understanding of history is tied to actual existing human freedom. Um, I, I already explained this uh, before with the difference between the Hegelian and the Marxist. So. Must have to come up with this nonsense. So now we understand their aims. We have to realize that the priests can't do this alone. They must convince people to join the cults before they destroy us all. And how do they do that? They trick them. Now, I've got to explain this. I was a socialist back in the day, but I wasn't a Marxist. I had a keen eye for history and understood that Cambodia, China, and the Soviet Union were bad. And they <laughs> He pats himself on the back. I wasn't a Marxist. I had a keen eye for history. Yeah, we know you weren't a Marxist, buddy. We can tell you didn't actually do the readings. Understood that communism had failed. I had read George Orwell, who is still my favorite fiction author, <laughs> but I was misled into... What else even needs to be said? What else needs to be said when your favorite author is an MI6 agent? <laughs> <I mean. laughs> Believing that the workers needed external help to save them from capitalism, and that help would come from the state. So I was a moderate socialist for practical reasons, and had never bought into the Marxist ideology. So You're I never a social democrat. Then you don't even know what the political labels are became a dialectic. I wasn't in the cult. Therefore, I can't explain why anyone would fall for this. I'm sure there are reasons why, and I'm hopeful that there will be an ex-dialectic somewhere in the comments who can explain to us how they got in it and what it's like to be, you know, see the world from the point of view of a dialectic. But I can't... What's that uh, saying? Dialectics are like cocaine. Um, what? <laughs> the more you do, the the more you want, or whatever. Uh, once you start to learn dialectics, it changes the way that you see the world, and it helps you understand social phenomena, and it helps you understand the world that you're in and how to operate within that world um, as sort of a a an actor um, in history, and you know you can kind of place yourself um, in your in the historical context. It's it's really helpful and. You want to look at everything that way, like uh, like China applying contradiction analysis to every aspect of society. Um, and it's it's working well for them. I mean, these guys can say the failure of socialism all they want um, when China's abolishing poverty and building high speed rail connecting every center of economic power in their country. It's becoming harder and harder for these people to say that. It, and in the post Darwinian world. Dialectics has already a footing in common sense. Most people realize that you cannot really understand something correctly if you separate it from the environment in which it operates. You need to understand a thing within its environment and the interconnections in which it exists. Most people also understand that really to get a grasp of something, it's not enough to just pick one moment of it 
and then pass judgments on that, that you have to see its development. I give the boxing example all the time. No one would trust a boxing judge that only saw the 12th round of a fight. They realize that in order to pass judgment correctly, they need to see the development of the 12 rounds. They need to see the whole fight. People realize that in order to pass judgment correctly on something, it's not good enough to just zero in on that. You have to see it in its context and its interconnection, the role that it plays in the whole, in a specific form of totality. People also realize that entities are not homogenous, that there's conflicting and contradictory forces within things, and that those contradictions help uh, determine the route that things end up taking. And, you know, this is, uh, there's a plethora of examples that can be given, get, given in nature, in society, and in human thought for these phenomena. And that's the basics of dialectics. Movement, contradiction, propelling that movement, keep an eye towards totality and towards constant interconnection. And, and really, that's it. In terms of its, the dialectical ontology, the th claims that we say about the world, that's basically the premise of it. Then we develop upon that certain laws of change, certain ways uh, that categories relate to each other, certain ways that we can come to know this world dialectically. We see it as a process of ascending from the abstract to the concrete, et cetera, et cetera. But that basic level of, of you know, certain fundamental premises of dialectical thought, it's already almost common sense for the vast majority of people. People know that you understand the painting Bob Ross did better once you saw the whole process. Once you saw him ascend from the abstract canvas to the whole painting. They understand it better than if they just showed up and saw the painting. You know, so it's, a lot of these things are common sense. So to, to speak of dialectics as this mystified religion that you have to take a leap of faith in order to believe and it's completely contrary to reason and empirical investigation. It's absurd. It's to show yourself for what you are, which is completely ignorant of that which you're talking to, I'm guessing millions or hundreds of thousands of people about. It makes more, dialectics makes more sense the more you apply it and the more that you use it to study the world. And like you can apply it to, like you said, common sense things that you already knew. Like my one of my favorite wrestling coaches has this saying called what you focus on expands. Right. That's like dialectics, because as you tarry with something, you begin to see it all sidedly. You begin to see it in its totality rather than just in its isolation, rather than just seeing one particular part of a thing. And you come to understand it more fully um, based on its, you know, internal contradictions and, and all the component parts that make up a thing. Um, so, you know, you can once you understand dialectical materialism or the more that you understand it, the more you can apply it to like little kernels of wisdom that you had been given in the past or, you know, experiences that you've had in the past, it helps you understand the world better. Um, so also pretty interesting here, just a little Easter egg that I found. Look at who his source is um, on this Marx work. We have a contribution to the critique of political economy quoted from Garrido's Marxism and the dialectical materialist worldview. So, wow, we've really made it in the world. I got my copy of that right here. Um, Carlos Garrido's Marxism and the dialectical materialist worldview is what this dude nitpicked um, to. Um, and apparently he completely ignored um, the rest of the um, genius works of theory in this book that Carlos so meticulously and kindly put together for us to help us understand Marxism. It all went over Buddy's head, but uh, I'll play it again. But pretty, pretty funny. <laughs> you feel like you made it in this world, Carlos? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's pretty crazy, but. Um... It's such a widely available text that it, it, the, you, when you do scholarship, there's things that you can infer about people from where they're citing stuff from and what they pick to cite certain like widely available texts. So like, um, you know that when you're citing capital, you should be citing the penguin version because that's the version that people doing scholarship in that area are citing. Um, there's a million examples like that. When you see someone like quoting a very basic text from like someone else's source and quotes like that, that like I can literally point to like what part of the book it's in, you realize they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. 
So, like, there was no need to quote me. Just quote the fucking original source. The fact that he's quoting me kind of implies that he doesn't have a grounding in this tradition. Like, I wouldn't quote me to find right. a quote that is a very basic quote that on, on a book that's been published a million times. Um, right. Yeah, but, I mean, that makes perfect sense. I didn't even think about it that way, but... um. It also makes sense, like, Cobra Commander says this could be a targeted op against Midwestern Marks. And mm. I always say that jokingly, but I talked about, you know, the, how the NED is writing the scripts for these groups like uh, Kings and Generals, these big history accounts, how they are all have sketchy connections. Um, a lot, of, I don't know if this guy specifically is connected to hashtag Project Ukraine, but that's really an umbrella of organizations in these accounts that stem from Kings and Generals, the NED account. And we're, you know, there are more groups like us who are pushing a dialectical materialist worldview, you know, a, a scientific worldview. And that is the ultimate weapon in the, in the hands of the proletariat, right? If they ignore someone like this and actually learn dialectical materialism, they're going to be a really, really tough revolutionary for the ruling class to defeat without killing them. Right. So why wouldn't they be putting out videos like this, just discouraging people from even reading it. Right. It's just gobbledygook. It's nonsense. Don't even read it. It's a religion. Everyone who tells you to read it is trapped in a cult. Meanwhile, I'm not going to engage with the actual arguments being made. I'm going to misconstrue them and straw man them and then make the video really long. So you think I have some kind of authority. Um, but yeah, I mean, like if, if any of the propaganda videos that we've broken down on the stream are targeted at us, this one is it. Um, but I want to play the part here where he talks about um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, it looks like, because I'm having so much fun listening to Carlos breaking down um, these deep philosophical concepts. I thought you were getting a little off track earlier with the wokeism thing, but you it all tied back to the argument he was making. Um, so I think this is a great <laughs> philosophical um, learning lesson for all of us here. Nobody can predict the future. And the fact that you think you can is an indication that you've fallen into a cult. You can't predict the future. The Building the future society is the work of the work of history. It's the work of the future. So it's time to the red pill. Sorry. You know, we have agencies of people that go check buildings and, and that will tell you, if you don't get this fixed, this building is going to collapse. It doesn't take a magic eight ball to see that when there's certain fissures in the structure of a building, that means that if things take their course, that building will likely fall. The person that goes, the architect that goes to check and that passes that judgment through that inspection, he's not a cult leader. He's just someone who has a concrete understanding of what he's looking at and is realizing that if things continue the route that they're going, the trajectory is this one, you know? So that's all we're doing. We're looking at capitalism as a whole structure, as a mode of life. We're observing its contradictions and we're saying if these contradictions continue the route that they're going, this is where it's gonna end up. It's no different than when an inspector goes to check a building and sees that if there's certain cracks and certain things in the roof and that, you know, with uh, wear and tear and if with, with this natural process, it might collapse. Um, so, you know, to we're not saying like, you know, when communist society gets here, there's going to be X amount of people in this population. And, you know, we're not doing what the utopians did, which is go very deep into details about what it is. We're just passing judgment on the basis of what we are observing after a rigorous scientific investigation of our current mode of life and where it is likely to be going because of the trajectory that it is already on. Like the trajectory of capitalism has been to monopolize. It's already centralizing uh, the forces of production. It's already socialized the forces of production. So is it irrational to say that this is heading towards the trajectory of well, we had uh, individual private property and individual uh, individuals working. Then we had sustained the private property, but uh, um, we socialized production. The trajectory seems to be that you are going to socialize the ownership of that socialized production. 
the accumulation of that socialized production. Um, so, and if it's centralized, it, 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 you know, it's the conclusions are drawing themselves out as we analyze the system scientifically. So it's, you know, to pretend that we're sitting here with an eight ball and just imagining what the next society is going to be like, it's absurd. That's such a fan, right? The building of the next society is the work of the future and the work of history. Like I said, and Marx is clear about that, but that analogy with the architect looking at the structure of a building that he knows is going to collapse is so true. And that's such a good example for anyone because everyone living under capitalism knows it's a crisis or crisis ridden system. It's an inherently unstable system. That's undeniable. Even in bourgeois economics, they have this concept of the business cycle. Right. They understand it's built into capitalism that it's going to incessantly break and then it, it, you know, can recover. And a lot of bourgeois economics is about how do we maintain this system and keep it going and keep profit coming in um, when the business cycle takes its course. But that's just the bourgeoisie admitting that capitalism is an inherently crisis ridden system and just trying to say, oh, it's just a feature. You know, it's something that we have to deal with. No, you know, this is a product of the system being unstable in a contradictory system of value production at its core. Um, so that's how we can predict that the system is going to collapse. And, you know, to the extent that socialists do predict the future, it's been people like Rosa Luxemburg saying socialism or barbarism, right? You could just have the whole building collapse in on us and we just, you know, turn to violence, fascism, barbarism, fighting each other for resources and water and things like that. Or we could have socialism, an equitable society um, with a rational system of production. And we've already seen this play out in other countries. Yeah. Like, we've already had the socialist revolution in other countries. Unless you're worse than Marxist and uh, say that's not real socialism. Hmm. But we've already seen that destruction of the building plan out in other buildings. So it's not a rational for us to sit here and say it might happen in the other places that had similar conditions to what ended up happening in these places. Right. It reminds me of some, someone got asked, I can't, I don't know who it was, but they got asked, has socialism worked in Cuba? They're like, well, did capitalism work in Cuba? Because socialism evolved out of capitalism in Cuba. You know, you don't have capitalist imperialism in Cuba. You don't have socialism. It's something that emerged from the internal contradictions of capital, the collapse of capitalism or, um, the expansion of imperialism and, you know, it's its tendency to super exploit other nations until people are ready for revolution. Um, so, right, to just say it didn't work is such a silly oversimplification that doesn't help us learn anything about the country or history. Now, I want to bring up this quote from uh, Althusser in 1953. He says, now, since the appearance of capital, the materialist conception of history is no longer a hypothesis, but a scientifically proven proposition. <laughs> Like just just look at how like historians, how historiography has changed after Marx. Now historians must at least give some semblance of a class analysis and an analysis of the material forces of society. They have to do that. That's why you can get after Marx certain bourgeois historians that their heart might not be with socialism, but they'll do good historiography. And anyone that's in the field of history and and is a Marxist realizes that. You weren't getting that before Marx. Before Marx, you had the great men of history. Very rarely would you hear about economic forces and the role that they play in shaping other phenomena in society. So in the same the same way that Marx's analysis of the crisis-prone character of capitalism and you know the polarization and the inequality, etc., has been accepted by the vast majority of bourgeois uh, thinkers, the same way that even the theory of the state, like, what is the theory of the state of Marxism? Well, the state is an instrument of the ruling class. Um, what are these recent studies from Ivy League universities saying about the American political system? That it literally only represents the big monopolist and the, the big lobbyists that basically control the whole political system. It's the same thing here with uh, the analysis of history. Even the worst of the bourgeois historians have to at least play uh, a, a tongue-in-cheek tribute to a materialist conception of history in order to be taken seriously at all. Yep. Shout out to Edward Baptiste with the half has never been told. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great history from a non-Marxist thinker as far as I know that it's been really helpful in my research. Um, 
because it just focuses on the economics of slavery, which then if you take a look at it from the standpoint of production. If you start from there, um, it's so revealing about the political structures and the political antagonisms and, and what led the build up to the Civil War, which, you know, when you read it from more abstract or idealist historians, it's like you said, great man of history, um, which Lincoln came along and, and led the North. Um, and it's hard to, you know, I remember as a kid, like history didn't make that much sense to me. I'm like, yeah, but what are, what are the motivations here? What really forces a, a revolutionary moment to happen? When you look at it from the standpoint of production, it's, it's so revealing whether you consider yourself a Marxist or not. So there's a lot of badass materialist historians out there who aren't Marxists um, because of that. They up and get out of the matrix. We live, necessarily, in a society of continual and unending change. Change that can never be precisely charted in advance. Hey, it's one of the laws of the dialectic. We finally got one. You finally said something that's true about the dialectic. And uh, gave it to this guy. I don't know who Murray Rothbard is, actually. Do you? Uh, I don't, but I uh, can never be charted in advance. I mean... It depends on what you're talking about. I think that we can decipher certain laws of, of, of movement and interconnection, and um, it could help uh, in our understanding of where my, things might uh, end up. Um, you know, it's not a precise prediction, but there are observable laws in nature, society, and thinking uh, that are related to how things change and how they're interconnected to, to each other. Um, you don't have, um, once a new phenomenon occurs, you always have something of the old staying with it. And this was already in Aristotle, right? The, you know, Aristotle has substantial and accidental change In substantial change. Uh, the form that the thing has is removed, but the matter is sustained in the, new thing the prime matter is sustained and, and the new thing it ends up being an accidental change you know so, some material properties might transform but the form the thing as the type of thing it is sustains so change is always a process of sustaining something and removing something else and that's a law of change um and it's not just hegel and marxism that postulated there's a form that it takes in aristotle um, so insofar as that's a law, it gives us at least a certain um, ability to maybe not look into the future through like a, a glass ball, but to make certain predictions um, that are more likely than if we were just speculating without an understanding of these laws. For sure. Otherwise, sports betting wouldn't be a thing. <laughs> but how are they thinking that they can predict the future? Well, what they say is, we have this thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, and the synthesis is higher than the other two. This then becomes the next thesis. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Where is it? Where is it? You suck! You suck! Tired of seeing this Wikipedia ass explanation of the dialectic. There is yet another antithesis to this new thesis, and thus another synthesis again. And so, what we're doing is constantly moving higher and higher and higher towards God. Hence the word progressivism, which is progress towards God. Now, it's progress into the land of Looneyville, West Virginia. And so, we can't really call this progression. It's a denial of progress, too, like you said. They completely deny that there's any sort of historical progression or, or move to anything better, which is such like a depressing way to look at the world, you know, to think that we couldn't be moving towards a better and more rational society as, you know, it, it denies the enlightenment exactly like you said, um, and the, the good parts of the enlightenment. Fascinating. At all. We've got a synthesis after synthesis, in other words, a wrong answer after wrong answer, building up on top of one another in a giant pyramid of stupidity, the state. And what we're left with is one giant stinking pile of dung. Nonetheless, they call this progress. No, it's nonsense. However, this nonsense allows them to say, okay, down the line. I wonder what he aligns himself with politically 
Because that same rejection of progress is what the wokes do. Mm-hmm. That's what the that's what the right. wokes do. I see that now. I see that's why you brought up wokeism earlier. Right. And I mean you look at Foucault, look at his treatment of the prisons. Yeah, you know, you know, we're not tearing people apart with horses, but that panopticon boy, now we're dominating people's heads. That's much more profound. Where's progress there? It's like what? You know, there you know, there is a sense a certain sense of i mean ask the prisoner that's getting torn apart you can't but i'm I'm sure people would prefer um from getting torn apart in the middle of the village where everyone sees it they would prefer like incarceration for a few years than getting fucking torn apart or getting their limbs chopped off in front of people i think that's progress but no there's always a way to spin it into oh no it's actually more nefarious you don't see or, it, but you're actually self-regulating yourself and self-punishing yourself in this panopticon where, you know, you're not, you don't know when you're being looked at. So you just uh, end up punishing and, and uh, overseeing yourself and overseeing your own conduct. And it's, you know, so it's a rejection of progress. And then he does it too. Right. I want to say are getting rid of chattel slavery or any of the huge obviously progressive advancements have been made it reminds me actually there was a video like a buzzfeed video a while back that they just got lambasted for where they asked these college students like has america gotten any better since slavery and a bunch like a, most of them said yes but a bunch of these woke college students said nope <laughs> like it's just as bad now it's like what the hell are you talking about what are you talking about go live in that time then like jeez a it's big boring. chunk of today's and, and sorry, last thing, yeah, because I I forgot and um want to get it out. Uh, even Hegel or I mean Hegel and Marx, they never say that progress is linear. It's just this strain right. speeding forward, right? They're like there can be two steps forward, one step back. There can be one step forward, two steps back, three steps forward. You know, history doesn't just go zoom. Um, it's a zigzag. I've heard it described that way. Zigzag, yeah, that's Lenin's quote. Uh, zigzag, um. Absolutely. And, you know, the place that it's most clearly seen today in terms of this rejection of progress is how people undermine the civil rights revolution and the tremendous influence it's had in changing the forms of intercourse in our society, the the, the forms of intercourse within civil society, the consciousness of the American people. And, you know, it prevents them from actually understanding where the fuck we're at um, and, and what's happened since 1965 but uh to get back to that yeah it's it's not this fatalistic view of history like the problem is that these people they lack dialectics and so when they try to understand dialectics they understand it very one-sidedly and undialectically and uh in so doing just completely distort everything um but both for hegel and, and, and marxism and you go back and you have spinoza as well like, there's not freedom here and then necessity here or determinism here, right? This bourgeois, uh, it's not really, it's more than bourgeois, but it's this philosophical problem of, of freedom or free will and necessity limitations to that will. It uh, it doesn't make too much sense in, in, in Hegel and Marxism and, and Spinoza because freedom can never be divorced from the limitations to that freedom and uh, the limitations to that freedom, that which is determined, is always it, it, it always contains within it a, a, a component of will, and that's you know that's the the same like Hegel's idea is not that uh, spirit is just moving blindly and just people are just going with it. Like people align their specific individual wills in ways that are their own free will but they don't realize that their free will because they're conditioned by their society aligns with the movement of history. He calls this phenomenon of the alignment of the individual will freedom with the universal movement of history determinism. He calls this the cunning of reason. It's a dialectical unity of, of freedom and, uh, uh, and determinism. And you have the same thing in a different, more concrete form in Marxism. And so when he's talking about this sort of thing where, you know, um, freedom here determinism there and what what are you doing there's no will there's no that's that's bullshit it's a projection of his absence of dialectical thinking but then this will happen etc 
And it's nothing more than a trick of the mind. It's a blatantly obvious fallacy. It's a trick, it's a trap, snake oil, an illusion. They are trapped. He has to use all these descriptors to make up for his lack of argument. He said nonsense like 20 times, snake oil. Um, I've heard people call the dialectic a word game. It's all an ability to, or, I mean, it's all an effort to express the dialectic as this simplistic, idealist, um, abstract thing with no um, connection to material reality, which is the opposite of what dialectical thinking is. Um, it's like it's like I said at the beginning of the video, like a first graders or a first year philosophy students botched effort to explain what the dialectic is. Um, let's go. Let's skip forward. Uh, here it looks like he quotes Hitler um, getting towards the end here. But this is so interesting for me to um, break down with you, Carlos. This is this video is a gold mine of. Um, uh poorly made philosophical arguments i'm still in awe that it fucking quotes me <laughs> it might be yeah, that's crazy. it made us uh anywhere from eight to 20 bucks depending on what version uh-huh nature he doesn't mean nature he means a dialectic which he believes allows him to see the world correctly man has discovered in no, nature is the proof of dialectics, dummy. Not dialectics are the proof of nature. This is why Marx and Engels were so heavily studying anthropology, science, and mathematics at the end of their life. Because they realized that the work of Darwin, Lewis, Henry Morgan, and you know a lot of the mathematicians and scientists, as Engels writes in Dialectics of Nature, um, confirm you know dialectical philosophy and, the, and these laws about constant change and flux and the interpenetration of opposites and Engel's anthropological analysis has been confirmed and confirmed and confirmed. You know, there are small parts that are updated, which is how a materialist analysis works. We change, you know, certain things change as we gain more material knowledge about the world around us. Um, but, you know, he was years ahead of his time, you know, and what the theories he made in Origins of the Family, Private Property, and the State have only been confirmed by um, more anthropological research with time. So it's, uh, it's the opposite. It's not, you know, forcing nature into this word game of the dialectic. It's using the principles of dialectical materialism to, to look at these different fields and, um, make advancements in them like China's doing in every field. And, you know, we have nonsense like this, that our kids are being brainwashed with China's applying contradiction analysis and materially, in the way that both societies are developing and unfolding, um, we we see the difference there. We see that China's just kicking our ass, and that's only going to continue. Um, our intellectual leaders being propped up by a ruling class are, are nothing but sophists. And uh, the Except most famous, uh, the most famous American paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould, just to, because you mentioned anthropology, um, he has a famous quote where he's like had af anthropologist uh paid attention to Engels's writings we would be a hundred years ahead of time in our studies hmm. and uh, Stephen Jay Gould's freaking amazing by the way he's got so many good quotes nature the dialectic the wonderful notion of that almighty being whose law he worship the full notion of that almighty being whose law he notice how Hitler doesn't mention the dialectic Right. So he's saying this is what dialectical materialism is. And then taking a guy who killed dialectical materialists, a fascist who doesn't even mention dialectics, nitpicking his work and saying this is what the dialectic is like. This is the most painful, painful pseudo intellectualism to, to watch. I forget who it was, if it was Schmidt or uh, Rosenberg, but one of the famous Nazi ideologues, he said when. When Hitler got into power, today Hegel died. <laughs> but they're the best dialecticians in the world. I mean, get out of here. I mean, what else needs to be said other than that? Worships. Fundamentally, in everyone, there is the feeling for this almighty, which we call God. That is to say, the dominion of natural laws, dialectic laws, throughout the whole universe. <laughs> he forces it in there himself. Just like I said, Hitler's not talking about the dialectics. He's like, this is what he means. Trust me. Sure, he does tick history. 
Sure he does, pal. Yeah, the dialectic are these natural laws. The dialectic, according to these priests, is behind everything. God is the dialectic, the dialectic is God. For the Marxists, when the dialectic gets them to the end stage of history, they will have the new Soviet man, a super being known as the species being, which is what Karl Marx called it. For Hitler, this nature or dialectic is the one determining which race is going to dominate the world. The Gautuch's the, the, the Gautuch Vesson is a concept from Feuerbach that Marx uses for maybe like up until 45 when he writes the German ideology with Engels. He never mentions anything about species being Gautungswesen in German ever again. Yeah, there's some kernels of that concept restated in other terms. Uh, but, I mean, this is the sort of thing where when someone says something like that and you're in ingrained in that tradition, you just understand that this is a person that has not read uh, adequately uh, to be doing a video like that. Absolutely. I skipped forward a little bit. It looks like he delves into horseshoe theory a bit here. National socialists. It does vary depending on the particular person you're looking at and their brand of dialectic, but the principle remains the same. And here's the thing. When we look at the traditional political spectrum, you generally have communism on the left and capitalism on the right, supposedly. Obviously, I now reject this, but let's just go with it for the purposes of this video. Hitler and Mussolini, the Nazis and the fascists, do not like either communism or capitalism. They saw these as what? Thesis and antithesis. Therefore, they synthesized them together in a new position. A third position. Mr. Madison, what you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. That does it. Yep. You know that the Nazis coined, or the term privatization was coined under the Nazis? Because they just sold off all their, their public industry, public firms to corporations who are helping fund the rise of the Third Reich and the paramilitary death squads that the Third Reich was sending out to kill um, dialectical materialists and communists like Rosa Luxemburg. Um, it was just, it's just state violence to, um, maintain capitalism in a time of crisis. And one of my favorite sayings about fascism is every fascist takeover is a fa there's a failed socialist revolution, a failed communist revolution. Cause you know, it's the use of violence by the capitalist ruling class to, uh, suppress the revolution in a time of crisis, like what Germany was in. Um, profound economic crisis and, and maintain the rule of capital and um, to say they're just mixing communism and socialism because you know there's the government is doing stuff or whatever I don't even know I don't know this is uh, an embarrassing I mean in a in a society that made sense this is where like this would be an embarrassing video right it'd be someone who's clearly not read the t like I don't I think he considers himself a historian but he's making a video about philosophy here and he clearly hasn't read the subject matter. Um, he's clearly nitpicked these quotes to make it look like, you know, this is a real intellectually honest and well-sourced video. Um, when they're completely nitpicked quotes that he's reading his own meaning into completely. Uh, At least he's not American. I don't, he doesn't sound American. So he's not, he's he's not, not our figure. Yeah. Right. He doesn't represent the red, white, and blue boy. The Brits got to get their shit together. I mean, he does <laughs> represent the red, white, and blue in, in the UK. That's such a weird thing to, like, describe a country. Because, like, maybe half of the world's country's flags are red, white, and blue. Um, but, you know, what, what he's doing there is taking what, in the words of, like, Marx and the German, Marx and Engels and the German ideologies, taking 
uh, as true what men say about themselves at face value and not what they are actually doing. So at face value, at the level of what they're saying about themselves, the Nazis are third positionist. Uh, they're beyond capitalism and socialism. Um, you know, they take from some, from, from one side, from another, et cetera, et cetera. That's the face value. That's the ideological uh, manipulation needed to get working class uh, people on board. In reality, it's just capitalism. It's just capitalism that rollbacks the democratic rights the working class had won, uh, and that does so with impunity. Um, that's it. <laughs> that's basically it. It's the open terroristic dictatorship of the most developed segments of, of capital, Parts of the petty bourgeoisie go along with it. That's an accidental, not a necessary uh, or uh, an essential component. But it's 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 just the most reactionary form that capitalism takes. It's when the repressive apparatuses are constantly there to smash any gains that were made by working people. Facts. Um, so, yeah, that was Tick History. Uh Definitely a fun one to break down there. Um, thanks to whoever sent 